the next day, I I went and smashed my phone and, and got rid of all of the stuff except I had a backpack with me that had my a laptop and maybe like a single change of clothes or something like that. But I was like, I'm just gonna have to make this work. Austin, I am so stoked to have you on the Soul Seeker podcast, brother. You and I have been getting to know each other through your business speaker flow, which is our CRM specifically for speakers. And you've been so helpful in just getting set up with the CRM because CRMs are absolutely difficult. And through just talking with you, we noticed that, hey, we both align on some spiritual stuff. So I definitely am so grateful for you to take the time to come on the podcast and to speak about your journey. Austin, welcome to the Soul Seeker podcast. Oh man, it is such an honor. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, you're a good dude. And I love the work that you do. Like I, I really genuinely feel privileged to be able to chat with you today. So thank you for having me. Thank you, brother. I know you enough to know you're not blowing smoke. So I appreciate that. And let's get straight into it because you've told me a little bit of your journey, but I was like, hey, let's wait for the podcast to really unpack this. Now you left home at 16 years old. You grew up in Utah, right? <laughs> yeah. As, as a Mormon, a Latter-day Saint. Tell us about this process and what led up into leaving home at 16 and leaving the Mormon church and all of it. I know it's a lot, but we have time. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I grew up in Salt Lake City, very, I don't know, buried, I guess you could say in Mormon traditions. And the Mormon church is kind of a weird one. Honestly, it, it, from the outside, they do a wonderful job at making it feel very, I guess you could say, for lack of better words, right? So the church was started like in the mid to late 1800s. It's a very new religion relative to many. And there's different labels that have been applied to it over time, <laughs> as as happens with organizations like this. But really, like if you look at the the underlying traits of by the definition, what a cult is, you get a lot of those things inside of the Mormon church. And that is a tough thing to say from somebody that was, was on the inside of it for so long, because that is such a tab, taboo way to describe the organization. And I think based on the perspective, that's, that's a fair judgment of calling it a cult, but it is very much based on restriction and, and, and pushing aside the outside world and they have their justifications for it, but it leaves a sense of loneliness, I think, for a lot of people. And we're seeing this happen as the church has progressed over time. They're by their own leadership, calling it a hemorrhaging of members as time has gone on. And it's because of that. We we live in the most connected period in the history of humanity. And yet the organization is built around seclusion in a lot of ways. If you're not in, you're out. And there's those are fine lines that ripples even outside of the doctrine of the church, but into the cultural sort of agreement that are made between members. So anyways, it's a strange organization to be a part of in any capacity. And I I kind of, uh, you know, in hindsight, I, I called it, you know, it's intuition, I think uh, to a large degree, but I never really like bought into it. There's been so many periods. Uh, there were so many periods in my life where I remember just sitting there questioning the whole thing, but I vividly remember I was about maybe 10 or 12 and we were learning or the history lesson, so to speak, of the Old Testament was being taught. The Old Testament being the first book of the Bible for those that aren't familiar with the Bible. But uh, there's a story, Noah's Ark, which is a pretty common one. Basically, right, giant flood comes. God tells Noah to build a ship and to take two of every animal, bring it onto the ship, and then the ship would keep them alive during the flood very theatrical. It's a good story. Actually, there's, I think if you dig into the roots of it, there's, there's reasons for that, which we could get into Graham Hancock. I'm looking at you if you're listening. To this, oh, but, okay. We're um, getting into that for sure. <laughs> I'm making a note. So we'll circle it. back. Yeah. So anyways, but like as, as a, you know, young person hearing that story, the reaction wasn't, oh, like, let's look at the philosophical metaphorical meaning behind the thing. I'm hearing that the person in the sky told a person here on earth to build a boat and put two of every animal on it. It's like, that's not 
possible <laughs> was, the, was the impression that I had. And I remember sitting there in that Sunday school lesson, listening to the teacher or whatever, tell that story and just sitting there like that doesn't make any sense. Like, how is that even possible? And so basically that thought never left me. And like I said, I was 10 or 12. I was very young. I was not old enough to make any sense of that, that intuition that I had, but it lingered with me. And as I got a little bit older, I was, you know, at the point in teenage dumb where I'm realizing I'm like a unique individual that can make my own choices and have my own opinions about the world and so on. And so I started questioning that, like, you know, I had the sense that it was BS, so to speak, in maybe a less respectful way than I probably could or should be describing it. But, and and so I just realized like, I'm, this isn't, this isn't for me, you know, I, I, I can't align with this. And, you know, initially there was like a sense of, okay, well, if, if this one isn't right, then one of them has to be. And so I spent as a young person, probably more time than most young people do, like researching other religions around the world. I, I dove into Buddhism and learned about some of the other Eastern traditions, Hinduism and, and Sikhism and others. And, um, and, you know, for a while I was like, oh, well, I just need to jump ship to something so very different than what I grew up knowing and understanding and believing. And, and then that didn't really feel right because there are cultural misalignments there. I'm missing context. There's not a lot of support in the Buddhist community in Salt Lake City, Utah as a 14 year old yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So then, you know, I explored different Christian religions and, and, and that I didn't really find a fit for either, at least nothing that spoke to my soul the way that the world tells you a religion should speak to your soul. And so it actually led me to a pretty nihilistic place. At 15, I, my parents put me on my first antidepressant. I was feeling very detached from myself and from the world. And I, the story I told myself is, yeah, because I'm being forced to live this life that I completely disagree with. But, you know, from my parents' perspective is that you have a, a, a disorder. If, if you're growing up in the only true religion, if you don't believe it, the only thing that could be wrong is that you're depressed or something. Yeah. And so I, I went on this rotating cast of different pharmaceuticals for a long time. My, at the high point, I was on five different drugs, a couple of antidepressants, wow. one to help manage anxiety and sleep. And yeah, man, it was, it was miserable. I felt like a zombie really like uh, people say that, you know, yeah, they put you on drugs and you feel like a zombie. Ha ha. But it's actually really true. I felt just dead to the world. And it, that's, that spiraled worse. I was suicidal. I started self-harming. I was, yeah, it was, it was really dark days. And, you know, it's funny because like, I, you know, there's never any one moment where things sort of turn a corner. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I've, <laughs> you know, we, we talked before the show, maybe we'd get into psychedelics, but I actually attribute a, a big turn in my life in those early years to psychedelics, acid, LSD. I, not for the right reasons at all, but was exposed to it from people that I knew. And I've never been one to just like accept what people tell me as maybe my story suggests up until this point. So I got really obsessed with studying psychedelics. In fact, I don't know if you have ever seen Erwid, the Erwid vaults on the internet. Have you ever seen those? I'm not Erwid. familiar with that. Erwin, you said? Erwid. It's like E-R-O-W-I-D.org. Okay. It's, it's a website. But it's basically like an encyclopedia of drugs. All of oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, I'm aware of it. Yeah, explain for the listeners. So yeah. Yeah, it's basically like the Wikipedia of drugs. Seriously, like all of them, anything that you can imagine. The simple stuff like, you know, THC all the way through heroin and psychedelic drugs like mushroom psilocybin. LSD, DMT, all of them. And I got obsessed from like an educational perspective. I wasn't doing all of these things. I, I was like, right. Or whatever, but. <laughs> Age of the internet, uh, what you can find. And how old are you again? I'm 25. You're 25. Uh, so around that, it was about 10 years ago, which makes it what, 2012 or something like that? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Smartphones have just come out, you know? Yeah. I mean, you were, I'm just a little bit older than you. I'm 34. So when I was 15, you know, I feel like the internet was just like starting to bloom and blossom and we were just moving on from my, actually my space was just coming on. And it was about three years later when I turned 18, that Facebook came and, but yeah, it, it's so true. Like, cause there was, there's kind of like this small gap between like your age and my age where you 
you guys had so much more than we had. And I mean, you could keep going and you know go down that rabbit hole. But in terms of your point of having all the research at your fingertips at, in, in high school to research all these drugs. Yeah, that's something that I definitely didn't grow up with. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting information at our fingertips it's interesting too because the the mormon church really discourages doing anything on the internet because facts can be found on the internet and other yeah. things right i mean propaganda exists in all forms and all angles but yeah it was very much discouraged i had i had the uh I had to demonstrate that being with computers was like a passion of mine uh, mm. to let my parents allow for it. And then as they accepted that, I was able to do things that they didn't even know was possible. Like Tor, for example, when Tor first started happening, I was, what is I was Tor? able to access. Tor is, it's, I mean, in the simplest terms, it's a private way of exploring the internet. You basically, you, you make it appear as though your computer is somewhere else in the world. Oh, right. It's, yeah, it's like crypto uh, people can do it for things like that well I, we don't need to get into that sure yeah it's real geeky stuff <laughs> for sure uh, but just to just to clarify when we're talking about the encyclopedia that you're talking about where you can see all the drugs i just want to bring this back as well that when you were that age it's not that you were doing like quote unquote drugs i mean to me the word psychedelics you know i have a little bit of a resistance to it and it's because a lot of times it is like classified under a drug right that's how we associate it i like to think of it as plant medicine but then also with a caveat of understanding that when we're working with something like say mushrooms for example if we use it in a safe container intentional and like a more ceremony, then yes, for sure. It's plant medicine. Now that's not to say that if we go on a hike with our buddies and, you know, we use a couple of mushrooms or something like that, then it's not plant medicine. It turns into psychedelic and that's bad. I'm not here to say what's good or bad per se, but I do want to really point out that when you were this age, it does sound like it was mainly LSD or was acid, anything else. That was the initial one that caught my attention. Yeah. Okay. You know, it's to your to your point, right? Like for the longest time as a culture, we lumped all of these things together. Like it doesn't matter what it was, if it affected your state of consciousness, it's mm. probably a bad thing and it's probably going to kill you, right? Like we we all right. remember the there. you know, you sm smoke weed and your brain turns into fried egg commercials back in the day. Yeah. So totally. But what was fascinating with this quote unquote encyclopedia of quote unquote drugs <laughs> that I found was I really, I quickly noticed this pattern where, cause as I mentioned, we're not just talking about the psychedelic world. We're talking about heroin and meth and all the other ones too. And I was fascinated by all of it. And one of the things with Erwid, Erwid, however you pronounce it is not only does it have all the chemistry there and the, the typical onset peak offset sort of things that you experience on these drugs, but it had user reports. Mm. And what I found was that you'd look at the methamphetamine user reports and it was not healthy. <laughs> There's people talking about, oh yeah, it took this much before it took, put me in the ER. And these, I got so tripped out. I duct taped all of my windows closed. And like, these were real reports that people were putting in there. And, and then you would go and look at something like 2CP or LSD or psilocybin or any of these other ones. And the trip report stopped being self-destructive behavior and started being, I had a conversation with Jesus, or mm -hmm. I went for a walk in the woods and connected with this tree that I've been seeing growing up for my entire life. Or I walked outside in my bare feet and felt the vibration of the earth coursing through me. And so I'm noticing these things like, well, this, these are not in the same category here. Right. They're they're not the same, like just from the peop the perspective of the people that are, are using them, like they're experiencing a seemingly much more positive outcome than some of the more self-destructive drugs, so to speak. And these are all generalizations. I understand everybody has a different, unique experience, but that captured my interest was that it seemed like enlightenment is a word that gets tossed around way too much. And for the wrong reasons, I think, but there was a sense of enlightenment being achieved in this certain classification of substances where they weren't by others. And to bring this back to the state that I was in at this age, right? Mm -hmm. I'm a depressed teenager. Like the idea that there was something that I could take that would make me feel better or make me feel reconnected to the people around me was really enticing. And so LSD was the one that I, I 
kind of grappled onto from a conceptual standpoint. And then it was the one that I was able to get my hands on first. In fact, even before pot or alcohol or anything oh, else, wow. LSD was the first thing that I tried as a teenager. And I did it alone in my house, in my basement by wow. myself, dosed real heavy. Yeah. It, and it was, it was a mind bending experience as you can imagine. Like it, mm -hmm. I just, I never really looked at the world the same again to some degree. And this continued on as my journey continued as I, you know, sort of moved into adulthood, which led me to run away from home and all the rest of it. But so to answer your question, yeah, LSD was kind of the one. And that was just partially due to research and partially due to availability at the time. So, and if we fast forward and look at where you're at now, I mean, your co founder, I don't know, what's your exact role in the company? My formal title is president. President. Yeah. yeah. President of a emerging RM software and doing amazing things to help other speakers and coaches and people that have positive messages to help others. So you're doing such great work in the world. And before that, I believe you're crushing in sales. And I think you had another company, right? Did you? Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've had kind of a weird last few years as far as career goes. Spent some time in software. I've private investigation for a little while. Oh, wow. Sales. Yeah. I did a bunch of weird things before I landed on what I landed on. Still that, weird, but yeah. <laughs> well, the point is that you're doing positive things in the world, right? Just to really talk about this, this, the conditioning and narrative of quote unquote drugs being bad. And I mean, when you had the pharmaceuticals and you were taking the SSRIs, the antidepressants, and it was making you feel like a walking zombie that was not serving you clearly. And if it's not serving you, how could you be of service in the world? So it's amazing. Although like I would never wish that upon anyone or suggest to any parents or listening or to any teenagers to go and do what you did or what I've done in my youth. It is nice to know that that is part of the process. That's part of our journey and working with these quote unquote medicines is very therapeutic and healing because we are, especially in the Western culture, so disconnected from our soul, from our higher self, from something greater and more meaningful in this world than just going to work, going to school and living this mundane lifestyle. So I'm curious to hear from you at what point in this exploration, did you decide that it was time to leave home? Yeah, it was, it was within a couple of years. I was within a couple of years and, you know, I'd love to say that I had a moment of clarity where I realized that I was in control of my life and could, and could go do something meaningful and important in the world. That was not what happened. What happened was a behavior ended up getting me arrested twice, actually, but for, I would say relatively harmless reasons compared to some crimes that could be committed. I got caught with, with pot in my car once. And so in Utah, it's a zero tolerance policy as a teenager. So they gave me a DUI, lost my driver's license. Wow. Lost all of my, yep. Yep. And then, and then I got caught with some friends smoking weed and that led to a second arrest for possession. And uh, I mean, basically I just felt like my life was falling apart, you know, like I depressed, stuck in an environment that I felt horrible in, unable to make any of my own decisions, partially because of the environment I was raised in, partially because I had just been arrested twice. I hated school. I was miserable. And, and when I got arrested, I was given, I wasn't given, my parents were given the option either. Yeah. He goes to juvie because I had committed two crimes in a very short period of time, or you put him in an in-house or an inpatient mental health care facility. And, you know, like given the state that I was in, I don't think like, especially if I'm looking at it from my parents' perspective, like I would, you know, I really believe that my child was depressed and suicidal and doing stupid things because of that. And yeah, like that, that might work or at least sound, sound good in theory. But from my perspective, I was being forced to put on, be put on these pharmaceuticals because mm -hmm. my parents saw something was wrong with me when I felt like it was an environmental thing. And I was terrified that I was going to go and it, everything that I felt was bad about all of this 
the situation I was in was just going to get exponentially worse, lose more privileges and freedom, more drugs, harder drugs, locked up in a place where I don't have access to any of my friends or family like that was worst possible scenario. And to make matters worse in the state of Utah, if you become a ward of the state, essentially, I forget the exact language that they use legally, but if you get put into a mental health care facility before you turn 18, you're you're under the care of your parents until they de- they determine you fit to make your own decisions. And what I was telling myself was like, I'm not going to change who I am. I'm not going to suddenly become a good faith- faithful Mormon boy. And so I was going to stay locked up and my parents were going to keep me locked up. And so that lead led to me leaving. Uh, that was, that was when I decided I'm, I'm out. And so my wife now girlfriend at the time who was also in her own crappy situation, but we decided, you know, it's, it'd be better to risk everything in this life that we know, but be free than it would be for me to be locked up for a long time for for the foreseeable future as far as i was concerned and so no that's amazing you made that move and just for clarification when you said going in the mental institution and until the parents are deeming like you appropriate fit was that even past the age of 18 or just up to the age of 18 even past, past the age, the age 18. of 18 what yeah, that, I was so I was 16 and a half at the time. I was absolutely going to be there until I turned 18. So I was I was staring down the barrel of a year and a half no matter what. But yeah, like past that point unless I unless I convince my parents and the state that I'm I'm now all the things that they want me to be. Yeah, I could stay locked up for as long as they feel like they they wanted me to. It's terrifying. A terrifying thought. That is. Well, I'm happy you found uh, your footing and you are where you are now because everything seems to be going great, you know, in (laughs) terms of living the life on your terms. Zooming or rewinding back to that time, what did it feel like when you decided to leave with your girlfriend, your now wife? Like, what was your plan? How did you create a plan? Did you create a plan? Did you just leave? What What did it look like? Yeah, you know, like it was it was just like total depression at first, and then I don't I don't even remember the exact moment when I was like, well, I could just like leave, but I just I remember like for the first time in probably years, I really had a sense of hope. I was like, you know, I that maybe, maybe I'm homeless, but at least I'm making my own choices. I get to be who I want to be. And I don't have to worry about trying to conform to some of the things. So I felt hopeful. I felt like, Holy crap, I I can, I can do something different than what is being laid out in front of me right now. And so, yes, I did have a plan of sorts. I, I was lucky. I had one person, one adult in my life who was my, my father's father. So my grandpa who had been basically estranged from the family for reasons. He was not a Mormon, that being the biggest one. And so he's an untouchable, so to speak, but we had stayed in touch. My parents allowed it because I had a relationship with my grandpa and you're a pretty messed up person if you don't want to allow that to happen. And so I, I, during this whole period, I was telling him where I was at. I was really honest with him. Like these are, I'm doing dumb things, but I'm, I'm absolutely miserable. And when this decision was made, or given to my parents to either lock me up in juvie or send me to this mental health care facility. I, I told him about it and he, and he believed in me. He believed that it wasn't that I was just a teenager that was intentionally making bad decisions and trying to be a menace to society. He believed that I was really genuinely in a bad situation and just needed some help. So yeah, we, we, we came up with a plan together. Basically I was to buy a a car illegally because I didn't have a driver's license, if you remember, but I was going to acquire a car and I was going to drive myself and my girlfriend, now wife to Oregon where he lived. Mm. And that was, that was the plan. It took, it was about two, three weeks basically between when that happened and when I was supposed to go. So we had that time frame for me to like, like get a car, and like pack my stuff up secretly and, and go. And so that's what we did. And we, it came to the night before that we were supposed to leave and I was out somewhere and my dad found a way to get into my computer and found all of the emails between my grandpa and I coming wow. out of this plan. Yeah. And, and I was driving this little car around while I was out and about. And I got a text from my sister. My sister's five years younger than me. At the time, she would have been 11. 10, you know, okay. yeah. yeah, 11. So yeah, anyway, somewhere in there. 
And she said, hey, dad found your emails and uh, he called the police and they're waiting for you at the house. So don't come home. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. So, and they, they knew what kind of car it was. They knew everything. And so there was literally a manhunt happening for me. There were police on the streets looking for the car. They were waiting at the house, waiting for me to come back. And my dad was basically going to just have me locked up that night. That was the plan. So I drove the car far away from my house. Well, several miles. I left it. This was in the middle of winter. It was a giant blizzard out. I had nothing else. I didn't even have a coat on. I just had like my shirt and my pants and stuff. So I just left the car and I went and found a tree that there was no snow underneath. And I went and laid under that tree for a few hours. And my plan was just to like, like make do for a couple of days and then figure out what was going to happen. Luckily I made through the night without dying. So that was good. It was really cold and miserable, but I made it the next day. I, I went and smashed my phone and, and got rid of all of the stuff, except I had a backpack with me that had my, a laptop, a separate laptop than the one my dad found and maybe like a single change of clothes or something like that. And I was like, I'm just going to have to make this work. So I, <laughs> I like found a friend who's willing to let me couch surfing for a couple of days and talked to my grandpa and he had a girlfriend that nobody really knew about in the family. And uh, he basically arranged to have her and her girlfriend. And we're talking my grandpa's girlfriend. This is like a 70 year old, cute little grandma lady, right? But yeah, she flew into Salt Lake City and picked me. My wife had her own, her own situation during those couple of days. But yeah, she she picked picked us up with her with her little grandma girlfriend and, and drove us to Portland, Oregon, where we were officially free. Well, free-ish, you know, we still have the cops working, looking for us and stuff but yeah that was that was how we got out and like I'll never forget man that first night on the road where I was away from home and I knew like unless there was awful luck I was not about to be found anytime soon and like I really genuinely felt like happy for the first time I was like I felt like it was just the beginning of a new chapter and it was I mean in hindsight that's how it happened that's an amazing story thank you so much i mean that's incredible there's little parts of it that remind me of different stories or maybe movies i've heard in my life and i mean it's totally different but it makes me think of the movie revenant is that what's called with dicaprio where he fights sleep, the bear I, the bear yeah yeah which i mean that's extreme and a totally different extreme sort of level yours is extreme in a western culture and society that we live now nothing that i've gone through and it makes me think about how a lot of people these days whether it's going through like a, a, a darkness retreat where you go six days without darkness or even a vipassana a silent retreat or a vision quest any of these type of things and how we subject ourselves to really get rid of all the distractions in the external world world to find ourselves within. And I don't think there's anyone in the world, obviously at any age, but especially under the age of 18 while in high school, that should have to be subjected to that and not to kind of make this about you being a victim and taking, cause I'm very big in being mindful about how our conditioning around society lends itself so well for us to embody that victim mentality. Right. But in this case, like I do feel like if your parents and family and close unit wasn't so tied to the Mormon church and everything that came about it, then maybe they would have been able to help you in other ways. I'm curious to hear from you if that's something that you feel and what comes up for you in terms of that topic. Yeah. Yeah. I hate the victim mindset. So I, I really truly believe that we create the world that we're in and we do that by setting our intentions and our perspectives about like what life is and why and how things happen. And so I absolutely don't feel like a victim at all. And in fact, I had a huge role to play. Like there's no doubt that as a sovereign human being at any point, I could have made the decision to toe the line and whether that's right or wrong is, is a totally different conversation. I don't know if there is a right or wrong, but certainly I think that as a, as a child, we owe a certain amount of, of, of being who, our parents want us to be because we don't know any better. We have to, we have to, 
to some degree or another conform to the environment that we're in. And I could have made that decision at any point and probably my life could have turned out very similarly to the way that it has right now. So I believe that I had the power to look at things differently at the time. But I mean, going back, I have to give myself grace. I don't know all the lessons that I knew now or know now then. And I was really pissed for a long time, <laughs> just to put yeah, it frankly. I imagine. I, 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 and I really mostly blame the church. And uh, to be fair, I still do think that they have responsibility, not just in my situation, but just as a large organization in this world that we're in today, that rather than preaching kindness and acceptance and loving of others, they're preaching that everybody is wrong unless you believe what you believe and giving now the ability to judge others based off of that to the members of the church. So yeah. yeah, I, I, they have, they have a fault to play too. Go ahead. For sure. <laughs> I love how you take responsibility as well, though. That's amazing. So real quick, I'm going to mention three different topics and I'd like to hear you rank them and from one to three, one being most interesting to you to least interesting. The first is quantum physics. The second is soul contracts. And the third is whatever you're going to say about the Graham Hancock rabbit hole. <laughs> oh man, the Graham Hancock one is probably the least tied into what we've talked about so far. But in terms of my current level of interest, that's for sure number one. Okay, sweet. Uh, yeah, number two would be quantum physics. Number three would be soul contracts. Okay, cool. Are you familiar with soul contracts? Uh, I know of them in theory. I yeah. Not, I, familiar is probably not the best word though. Yeah, I mean it's it's pretty simple to conceptualize for anyone listening that might not be familiar with it, like. The movie, the Pixar movie Soul illustrates this so well in the great before. If you've seen it, if not, God, if you're listening to a podcast called Soul Seeker and you're at all interested in mindfulness, spirituality, consciousness, anything, homework assignment is to go watch that movie. Then go watch my 60 minute review on YouTube, explain that movie in deeper content, essentially. So Soul Contracts. It's like before we enter this realm, it's a my belief. And I'm not here speaking absolutes in my belief system. We choose the relationship. So we choose who we incarnate with and with our soul pod. Taking a step further, we choose our parents, we choose our children, our pets. And even the fact that you and I are having a conversation here, like pretty much any conversation or relationship that has a little bit of substance to it, I believe that was already planned. And we do have a certain level of free will when we're here to the extent of, yes, we decided that we were going to enter this realm at a certain time. And that became part of like our horoscope and our astrology and our numerology and our human design and the soul contracts. But then it's up to us in terms of free will of how we're actually going to play it out when we're here. So the reason why I brought up soul contracts is it would be very interesting to do some work to look at like whether it's your parents or any of this type of stuff of like why was it that you chose to incarnate with those situations and how that was going to be for the highest good of your soul that's something i'm super fascinated on, on. so if, if anyone's interesting interested in that a great book is sacred contracts by carolyn mace it's all about soul contracts so we won't go there quantum physics you did mention that you do believe that we are the creator of our reality. So I would love to hear what comes up for you when you express your interest in quantum physics. Sure. Well, this, we're on the fringes of what I understand from a scientific level. Okay. So I'm going to start there. I think that there are good analogies to, to how it's possible. And again, I don't know. I don't know if anybody actually knows how this universe that we live in is created. The best example that I've seen so far is the Unreal Engine, which is a video gaming system that is used essentially to create the world that you play in as a, as a character. And to, so like, let's, we'll pick an example. I'm, I'm a huge geek here. So we're, we're treading into geeky territory. One of my favorite games of all times is Skyrim, which is a Bethesda studios game. And essentially you're put in this, this country called Skyrim. There's magic and dragons and battling with swords and all types of stuff. It's a massive world. It is a gigantic map. It takes in the real world, many minutes, if not hours to go from one end of the map to the other end of the map. 
and to to make it possible for that to happen so that our computers can actually run this type of game it doesn't generate the entire map all at once basically it uses what the character you the character the player in the game is looking at and manifests that in front of you and and that saves processing power basically behind the scenes so that you're only worried about the mm -hmm. thing that's in your view right now and i think that there are that's it's analogous to how we know particles work in the real world that there's that famous double slit experiment right where you fire a bunch of electrons at the two slits on a piece of metal and the way that the particles themselves is as a wave and so you can actually detect the particles going through both slits at once if you're looking at the outcome however you place a camera so that it's looking at the two slits and now suddenly those particles no longer behave like a wave. They behave like individual particles. And so the particle will choose, quote unquote, one of the slits to go through. And now we can only measure them in one spot. And so, again, I'm on the fringes of what I understand about this stuff. But what it tells me is that human consciousness and the things that we're paying attention to directly affect the way that the universe manifests itself in front of us the power of human consciousness and attention is maybe the thing that makes the universe what it is and so when you ask like how like what that brings up for me i and this ties into my point about we create our own reality i really truly believe that the things that we put our attention on is what manifests itself in front of us because as far as we can tell at the lowest levels that we can get that is exactly how the universe works is the things that we pay attention to manifest themselves and so I think the way that we look at ourselves, the way that we look at the world around us, the way that we look at our relationships, and I both mean like visually look at and also from the of how we think about them and how we try to conceptualize them. I think that's how it plays out in the world. And I've seen in my own life many times that the things that I pay attention to are the things that become in some form or another. And I also think that it's a shame when you believe that the world is happening to you instead of happening through you, because subconsciously you're making decisions about what to pay attention to. And, and if you're not careful, then that subconscious can create a very different world than what you would create if you were doing so intentionally. Thank you for saying that, that last piece of, if you're not careful, because there, as many of the listeners know, and you know, I work with, have worked with quite a few plant medicines and my book, Soul Life Balance is all about integration. So much so that the subtitle is a guide to igniting and integrating spiritual awakenings. And one of the things that I don't think is talked about enough is the negative side of manifestation when we're not careful exactly how you put it. Because if we're not living an intentional life and we're kind of just going through the emotions, especially whether it's with plant medicine or not, if you're going through it and like you're in the thick of a dark night of the soul or, or you feel tapped in, that's when it's just like, what's the word I'm looking for? The pace increases essentially. So I've experienced experiences firsthand and working with 5-MeO DMT, the Bufal Varius toad. And this is a medicine, I call it the manifestation medicine. So very much so you become more cognizant and awake in this dream state and you're able to manifest more. But on the flip side, if you're not careful, those negative manifestations that you brought will come through. And I love that you brought up the gaming side of it because I don't have that kind of mind or background or I was never really into games either. Um, however, there's a documentary called A Glitch in the Matrix. Have you seen that? I haven't, but it sounds familiar. Dude, you'd love it. It can't. So for the listeners and you and everyone, write down a glitch in the matrix. I'll put it in the show notes as well. I'll link to it. It came out a year or two ago and it is fantastic in how it breaks down the synchronicities we experience in this, this realm and quantum physics. And one of the amazing things that aligns to what you spoke about was they have this scene in it where they're talking about like, and they show it so well on the screen when they're showing it, but something about going like they're in a car. And then as the car is moving, like the scenery around you is being created kind of like what you were saying about the processing time to not have the whole world in the video game already there. It's very fascinating. 
Yeah, that sounds fascinating. Yes. Yeah. I know one of the things that I love along this lines too, that's starting to emerge is simulation theory. Exactly. Uh, that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, a YouTube channel that I've just been obsessed with over the last couple of months. It's called the Y files. It's mm. just masterfully done. But uh, if you want a, a snippet is like a 15 minute video outlining what we just talked about and specifically my analogy about the unreal engine, the Y files simulation theory, it will, it will throw really okay it'll make you think <laughs> it'll make yeah you think. i'm not gonna say it's gonna change your world but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah no no i appreciate that i will find that in show notes all right so as we begin to wrap up here i definitely want to create the space to speak about graham hancock so the floor is yours whatever comes up because i went down the graham hancock rabbit hole as well i haven't gone there in uh recent year or so but i'm very much interested in that as well so i'd love to hear what you're so fascinated about in terms of graham hancock's work yeah man i mean what he suggests is is a complete rewrite of how we view human history and i think if you take a step back away from just like the details of what graham discusses which we can get into i think it actually answers a lot of questions about the way that we look at things like religion as a humanity. So maybe I'll just, for those that aren't familiar with Graham Hancock. So what Graham Thank Hancock you. has has suggested is that there is a time before written history where human societies were vastly more advanced technologically than we think. In fact, he there's a, a brand new doc, documentary series on Netflix that just came out a couple of weeks ago called Ancient Apocalypse, where he outlines everything that he's learned over the last couple dozen years. He was just on Joe Rogan with Randall Carlson making this a discussion as well. So part of it is it's fresh for me, I guess, but it was a cataclysm that happened. 12 12,800 years ago, they call it the Younger Dryas. It was essentially a series of asteroidal impacts that hit the earth and it fully, full stopped society as we know it. In fact, all of humanity's civilization, all the human beings on earth was reduced to a very small number. Was, I don't know that it's like 30,000 or something like that from, from millions, right? So humanity just about went extinct. And what's fascinating about this, this storyline, um, amongst many other things, but what happened during that period was a period of gigantic flooding all across the earth. Remember we were talking about Noah's Ark a minute ago? <laughs> well, that story, Noah's Ark in Christianity, well, in the Hebrew religions, Judaism and Islam would be included there, is the, well, roughly speaking, the same story that existed in ancient Egypt, the same story that existed with the Mayans and the Aztecs in South America, the same story that existed with the Sumerians and the rest of the early Mesopotamian cultures, we're talking the earliest on the planet where it discussed a great series of flooding that happened all across the world. Almost all of humanity is entirely wiped out. Uh, and then those that remained were greeted by mysterious strangers, generally depicted in robes or cloaks that came in from the ocean somewhere and passed on a series of revelations and understanding to the remaining human beings on earth, thus beginning the next series of human evolution, which included things like megalithic structures being built and agriculture being established and greater ways of transmitting information via written text and carvings in stone and the historical take on this from archaeologists up until this sort of changing of the narrative that Graham Hancock is suggesting was that uh, agriculture suddenly bloomed from within hunter-gatherer cultures for unknown reasons. And, and that led to the history as we know it starting to be written. But what Graham Hancock is suggesting is that there was an, there was potentially multiple highly advanced civilizations with technology that was just as advanced as ours, though probably on a different path of advancement than we're currently on. Uh, some of which survived this cataclysm during the Younger Dryas area 12,800 years ago. And those that did survive from those technologically advanced societies passed the information that they they had from that period onto the remaining hunter-gatherer civilizations. And this, this transference of advanced technology is what led to society and the world as we know it today, fast forward, you know, 10,000 years. So that's, that's the theory. There's a million little details that I skimmed past here, but I, I think that it's, it's potentially answering the questions of how these great spiritual leaders from a time before ours came to be as they, they were genuinely from a, an earlier stage of 
of civilization and from humanity that just know more than we do. And these are where things like quantum mechanics and physics and astrology and the way that we use stars to do things here on earth. And I think all of that came from a time before ours, theoretically. <laughs> oh, I, I, this resonates with me a hundred percent. I love this stuff. And I thank you. Cause that was an excellent recap for whether someone's heard this before or first time introduction into all this. I feel like you said it really well and it's a very accessible language if it's your first time exploring anything like this it can be overwhelming and just be it'd be a lot for sure but there's there's so much truth into it, it when you pause and feel into it in your body and i'm not saying for everyone right surely plenty of people can pause and listen to that and feel the resistance for whatever reason because i'm not Try, just the like what you said earlier with the Mormon church, you know, just because it's my belief, it's your belief and whatever else doesn't mean that is what ultimate truth, right? But what's most important to your point in what you were saying about the Mormon church, about how they kind of, this is our way and everyone else is wrong. I think what's most important with, for people like you and I that believe this type of thing is be like, this is what I believe. This is my truth. And if you don't want to believe that, hey, that's cool too. And to me, that's the essence of spirituality because it actually, there's some parallels in our story when you were younger and, you know, looking at different religions and knowing that Mormon, the Mormon church didn't resonate. For me, I didn't look at other religions outside of Judaism growing up Jew Jewish. I am Jewish. I still consider myself Jewish because culture as well. But at the same time, like, back then i was very much a rebel as well i was like no this idea of absolutes and i didn't have the language to articulate it back then but i became like a, a spiritual person back then just i didn't know it, like being a spiritual person was a choice until recent years you know so so mate just to wrap it up though I want to make sure I get these links in the show notes. So it was the Y files on YouTube, specifically the episode simulation theory. And that would be around quantum physics. Like we spoke about, then you mentioned the episode with Graham Hancock on Netflix, it, or it's a new series. It looks like called ancient apocalypse. Is that right? That is correct. It oh, is, dude. Can I swear on this show? Go for it. It is a mind fuck. By mm -hmm. every definition, it will totally make you think differently about where we where we stand in in the history of humanity. It's a good one. Watch that one over the Y files. <laughs> Was not aware of that show, so I'm super stoked to put that on my list and check it out. It, did you finish it? I did, and it is wild. All right. So just to let you know, your company speaker flow that what we talked about, but didn't get into the business, it's CRM, all that. Austin's company's got a course for new customers. It's a lot of content. I'm prioritizing this over watching that course for sure. Such as soul <laughs> life balance, got to find I'm ways offended. to feed that soul. All right. And then the podcast you mentioned with Randall Carlson and Graham Hancock at the time of this recording, it looks like it just came out last week. Is that about right? That is correct. Yep. Cool. I'll put that specific one in the show notes as well. There's so many great re resources here. Austin, I really appreciate you sharing your story. This was like an overview in a bunch of different areas, primarily about the Mormon church, but then a few fun spiritual rabbit holes as well. Thank you so much for taking time on the podcast. Anytime my dog's ready, get out. Anytime you want to come back on the show and go down a specific rabbit hole, just let me know. I'd love to have you back on the show, brother. Let's do it, man. That sounds awesome. Thanks for having me again. Absolutely. Thanks, Austin. Awesome.